Growing up, I had a really hard time memorizing the Ten Commandments. Has anyone else ever had a hard time? I mean, you know them. You know the Ten Commandments, right? But it's hard memorizing the order, and sometimes you, when you're trying to list them down, it's like, well, what did I miss? You know, has anyone else struggled with that? I know I have a bunch of times. So I found a very easy way of memorizing the Ten Commandments. And so this is especially for the kids. Um, yeah, like you right there, yeah, I know, and maybe you two over there. So this is what we're going to do. This is, it's, it's the way that I, honestly, it's the way that I remember the Ten Commandments, the list of the Ten Commandments. And if you ever see me talking about the Ten Commandments at church, and my hands are behind my back, and you might see me doing like this, it's because I'm, it's because I'm doing my method of remembering the Ten Commandments, okay? And so this is how it goes. I want you to put your hands up like this. Everybody put their hands up like this, all right? And you're going to close it into balls of fists, all right? Into your fists. And you're going to put up the first commandment, commandment number one. Remember, uh, uh, don't remember, oh man, uh, you, thou shalt not worship any other god before, before me, right? This is God saying that there's only one god. There's only, I memorize it in this kiddie way, and so the wording comes out hard sometimes. But there is only one god. Worship the Lord thy God alone, and no other other gods, right? Only one god. Commandment number two. There are no other, uh, no, that was the commandment number one. Commandment... Commandment number two is, thou shalt not make any graven images. So basically what you're saying is, this one is not like this one. This one is not like this one. So there's only one, right? There's only one. And this one is not like this one. So thou shalt not make any graven images. That means that you can't make idols. You can't make like a little, a little, take this little tissue box and say, oh, this is my God now. You can't do that. Because this right here is not like this one. So that's how I remember commandment number two in that order. So there's only one God. And this one is not like this one, right? Okay, number three. Which one of the grown-ups remember which is number three? Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. So you cover your mouth. I won't take the Lord's name in vain. Cover your mouth not to take the Lord's name in vain. So commandment number one, there's only one God, only one. Commandment number two, this one is not like this one. You can't make false gods. You can't make like images or, or graven idols or anything like that. Commandment number three, commandment number three, cover your mouth. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Commandment number four, you see how these guys are standing up, but this one's lying down. He's resting. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. On this day, you shall rest from all your work. So these guys are standing up. There's four of them. This one's lying down. He's resting. One, there's only one God. Two, you can't make copies. Three, don't say the Lord's name in vain. Four, these guys are standing up. This one's resting. Remember the Sabbath day. Commandment five, salute your parents. Salute your parents. Honor your parents in the Lord. Right? This is the only commandment that comes with a promise. But so you salute your parents. You have to respect them. You have to honor them. All right. Commandment number six, thou shalt not kill. You can make a gun like this, like, there's only six. Not seven, six. Right? So thou shalt not kill. That was a gun killing someone. Can't have that. So, okay. All right. Commandment number seven, like this. This is a guy. This is a family. And he's trying to come into the family to break it up. So you got to swat him away. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is the guy trying to break up the family with mom and dad. And the family, together, they have to shoo him away. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Commandment number eight. All right. You go like this for commandment number eight. You have to go like this. All right. Thou shalt not steal, otherwise you're going to be behind bars in prison. So don't steal. See these bars right here? That's what they represent. Okay? So one, there's only one God. Two, this God is not a cop. There's no other God. You can't make copies of God. So, right? No copies of God. Three, cover your mouth. Honor the name of God. Don't say it in vain. Commandment four, this one's resting. Remember this half day to keep it holy. Commandment five, salute your parents. Honor your parents. Commandment six, Thou shalt not kill. Commandment seven. Don't, do not, thou shalt not commit adultery. Commandment eight. What happens? What makes you go to, to jail? If you steal. If you take something that's not yours. Commandment nine. All right. I have four fingers on this hand and I have five fingers on this hand. Is that right? No. I just lied. Because there's five on this hand and there's only four on this hand. But I said that there was four on this hand and there's five on this hand. Thou shalt not lie. Bear false witness. So don't lie. That's commandment number nine. And commandment ten, 
Gimme, 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 gimme. Thou shalt not covet. Be satisfied with what you have. Don't be like, gimme, 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 gimme. And that is how I remember the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so, I'll start telling you a short story. Um, the year was 1954, and the then senator of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy, he would need to be submitted to a back surgery. He would have to have a surgery on his back. And he would need to stay uh, bedridden for about six months to, you know, get better and to uh, heal and all that stuff. And he was a very active man, so he was wondering, what am I going to do uh, with all this time, right? What, how, how can I be productive during this period of time? And so he decided to write a book. And so what he did is he dived into the rich history of the, especially the American uh, War, the Civil War, and he extracted lessons of courage. I mean, if you remember at this time, the U.S. was, was being torn apart by, uh, you know, the fears and the anxieties of, of the Cold War. Everyone was kind of uncertain about what was going to happen. And so he wanted to uh, uh, encourage the country. He wanted to provide, you know, uh, comfort to the country. And so he dived into the history of the Civil War to extract lessons of courage and lessons of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah, courage and, 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 and hope to the country going through that, that period of time. The name of the book is Profiles of Courage, or Profiles in Courage. And so that's what he does. There is one book in the Bible, or a couple of books in the Bible, that are written with that exact same purpose. They were written with, with the finality of encouraging Israel that was being oppressed and was, you know, on every side. It seemed that there was an en enemy coming in and they were trying to overcome them. And so uh, the books of Chronicles, and really if you look at the the how the, the, the books of Chronicles were written, they're not two books. That was, that was a division that came on later. But really, uh, Chronicles is just one book. There's only one book of Chronicles, and then it was divided. Same thing happened to, uh, to Kings and to Samuel. These were books that were, they were so big that they were divided into two different books. So the books of Chronicles, they were written with the same objective, to inspire and encourage that small country of Judah that was being oppressed uh, especially by the Assyrian army, especially by the Assyrian army, uh, with its troops led by this ferocious king called Sennacherib. And I'm sure that you've read the story multiple times and, uh, and you've seen the outcome. Uh, but Assyria was a very famous country. It's, in history, it's very famous. It's very well known for its cruelty. This was a very extremely cruel country. All right, um, Archaeology has found tablets and scrolls and... Uh, depicting what would happen to the nations that were conquered by Assyria. And it's a horrible thing. I mean, they have images of people with their hands cut off, with their eyes gouged out, and uh, they, would, they would drag hundreds of thousands of people through the you know, uh, relentless desert on their knees uh, uh, by hooks in their, no this, in their noses. This was a horrible, cruel country. They were cruel, cruel, cruel. It's as though they, they delighted in cruelty. Their capital, the city of Nineveh, was known in the ancient times as the city of thieves. So basically what would happen is that the population of that city, not even the army of the empire, the population of the city, they would band together and they would go out and plunder and, and conquer other cities around them and destroy them and, and you know, practice horrible acts of cruelty. And that was the population, the city of thieves. Uh, the small, and so in this context, the small country of Judah, they find themselves on the brink of war with this crushing pressure of uh, coming from the, 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 the empire of Assyria. And as every day that passed, things got worse and worse. The perspectives were not very good at all. That becomes even more evident when we remember that 21 years before this event, Samaria, the capital of Israel, the ten northern tribes, had been completely devastated by the Assyrian army. Nothing, no one had been left behind. And now that threat turns to Judah. Sennacherib advance, ad advances victoriously. It's as though nothing can stop him. He just, he comes from a campaign from Egypt, so he comes from the south, and he had just obliterated Egypt. All right, a powerful nation. So Israel, Judah, forgive me, Judah, they're thinking, well, they just conquered Egypt. What are we going to do? How can we respond? How can we react to this 
to this danger. In fact, in his annals, uh, found by archaeologists in 1845, Sennacherib records that on his campaign against Judah, he conquered 46 fortified cities. 46 fortified cities. He enslaved more than 250,000 people. One by one, the fortresses fell before him on his crusade against Judah. Sennacherib seemed invincible. That suffocating siege closed now upon King Hezekiah and the population of Jerusalem. And we see here that Hezekiah, he tried many things. Initially, initially, in an attempt to appease this terrible king, he pays a a, a big amount of money, a large, a king's ransom. He paid uh, 800 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold, which is equivalent to today, in today's standards, to more than $40 million just to try to appease the king, to make him turn away and not conquer them. But his strategy backfired, and it didn't really bear any positive results because that just showed that they had money, and so Sennacherib was, well, if they have that, I mean, I wonder what else they have. And so he continued. If you observe here the initial verse in 2 Chronicles 32, it says that after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, look at that, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria came. And I want you to remember that this wasn't just anybody, all right? This king in Judah at this time, it wasn't just anybody. This is the great Hezekiah, the extraordinary spiritual reformer of Judah. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 through 6, we find a very small biographical note about this king, about King Hezekiah. Look at what it says. It's uh, 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6. It says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord, and he did not stop following him. He kept the commandments of God uh, that the Lord God had given to Moses. This was a great man. This was a good man. He did his best. The Bible says that there wasn't any other king in Judah just like him. And yet even after doing everything that he had done, all the good things that he had done, Sennacherib still came. You know, friends, by our logic, by our reasoning, good things should happen to good people, right? After, after fidelity, after being loyal to God, our, after sacrificing our, you know, our, our desires and, and, and whatever we want, and we put that in God's will, we expect that at least God will protect us, at least God will, will preserve us from the headaches of life, the anxieties of life. I mean, that's just logical. That's why many people come to religion, because they feel that their life is going bad, and they want that to turn around, and so they're like, well, I'm going to start going to church, and I'm going to start paying my tithe. I hate that term. I know that it's more of a cultural thing than a than, than, uh, than, than the reality of it. We don't really think that way. But when we're saying that, we're, we're paying, we don't pay tithe. We return tithe. There's a difference in that. Right? We don't pay anything. It's not like we're paying our dues. No. But a lot of people kind of consider it that way. And so they'll go to church to kind of change that situation. And so by their logic, good things happen to good people. But in this case, precisely the opposite happens. Because in this case, after all of the faithfulness of this king, after all of his acts of fidelity, after being a good guy, after submitting his life to God, after reforming Israel, uh, Judah, that had been for so long in, in, in depravity, after all these things comes the king of Assyria. The mind-boggling reality here is that problems also follow acts of fidelity and of loyalty to God. Friends, the Bible, or in the Bible, loyalty to, to God does not always equate to an escape from the hardships, the terrible ordeals, and the losses of life. Contrary to what the prosperity theology or the prosperity theologians believe, immunity to suffering is not a biblical doctrine. Apparently, Hezekiah was not compensated for his loyalty. And that should comfort us. Honestly, this is comforting for me. Because if this great king, it didn't happen to him, then it's easier for me to understand when things don't go the way I expect them or imagine them to go in my life. Remember, friends, that fidelity to God does not guarantee the absence of problems and suffering. 
what fidelity and loyalty guarantees is the presence of God. There's a, there's, I, I forgot who said it, but there's a quote from one of the great preachers that is basically, it goes like this, he who has God has everything. He who doesn't have God has nothing. And he who has God and has everything does not have more than he who has God and has nothing. Did you get it? He who has God has everything. He who doesn't have God has nothing. And he who has God and has everything does not have more than he who has God and has nothing. God is everything. He who is with God is always the majority. You are never outnumbered when the Lord God is by your side. But here in the continuation of the story, we find, we find the Assyrians' warfare strategy. Before arriving in Jerusalem, Sennacherib attacked the fortified cities of Jerusalem, directing himself from the periphery, from the outside, to the center. Forty-six of the strongest fortresses, the most important cities, fell one by one. His tactic was calculated to undermine and to demoralize Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. His intention was to destroy their courage, their will to fight back. He wanted to intimidate them and to bring them into panic. He wanted, to, he wanted them to, to render, to, 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 to deliver to him Jerusalem even before he got there. He wanted an easy victory. Observe also his strong psychological siege. Having surrounded Lachish, one of the last fortresses before arriving in Jerusalem, Sennacherib sends envoys who defy who challenge and who ridicule the faith of King Hezekiah. Verse 7 tells us that Hezekiah sought to tranquilize the, pop the population of Jerusalem. He tried. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and of the vast army that is with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. Now, before we analyze Sennacherib's pride, his arrogance toward he Hezekiah's response to his threats, we have to remember, friends, that even though in life we're not, we don't really choose. We can't choose the, the headaches that come our way. You can't choose the problems that you're going to have. Imagine if life were like that. If you could kind of choose, well, you know, I think that I'll be able to f face this better than I can face that. What if you could all together just choose, well, I don't want to I I deal with this. It would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? But that's not the way life happens. You don't choose the hardships that come. You don't choose the people that don't like you. You don't choose the situations that you're placed in. You don't choose the crisis at work or at home in your relationships or with your family. You can't choose these things. But no one can ever take away your freedom of how you react to these situations. You can't choose or you're not free to choose the things that come your way, but you are free to choose how you react. You can choose your attitude. The way that we react to the hardships in life, friends, that kind of tells, that, that, that's a revelation of what spirit we are. There's one principle in the Bible and in life, which is that crisis, it doesn't forge your character, it reveals your character. The crisis of life, they reveal who you are, the way that you react, the way that you, how does it happen with the, with the, the ten virgins? The crisis, the midnight, it didn't really form them, it revealed them. The emergency of midnight revealed of what spirit they were. But th their spirit, their character, was forged in the, in the easy days. When sunshine and, uh, sunshine and sunlight was there, it was midnight that brought the revelation of their spirit, that revealed who they were. Hezekiah's answer to this Assyrian siege it demonstrated a total confidence in he who has control of all situations. Hezekiah took his eyes, he took his eyes off the situation, and he placed his eyes on he who controls all situations. So you see here that people could have reacted, different people would have reacted in different ways. The situation is the same. The difference is where my eyes are at. Are my eyes on the emperor that's coming to destroy me? Are my eyes on my city that's, being, that's becoming uh, demoralized and, and, and desperate? Or are my eyes on myself and what's going to happen to me? Or are my eyes on God? who controls all these situations. Because everything else, I can worry, 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 but I can't really do that much about it. But when I look to God, I understand where deliverance comes from. 
In this case here, Sennacherib, he then attempts to undermine Hezekiah and his trust in divine intervention. Actually, friends, this is the, ba this is the basic, basic objective of all temptation. All temptation is, 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 is uh, focalized on us. It's meant to lead us astray from God and to trust in ourselves. The foundation of, of sin, the essence of sin, is truly rebellion against God. The Bible has one very famous definition for sin that you'll find in 1 John. At least one famous definition for sin to Adventists. If you ask 99% of the Adventists what is sin, you're always going to get the answer that it is transgression of the law. That's a very good definition, but it is not the only one. Did you know that the Bible contains 11 words that define sin? 11. Eight of them in the Old Testament and three of them in the New Testament. And they're not synonyms. They define different aspects of sin. Sin is not only transgression of the law, but sin is also what I don't do. You can sin passively by not doing anything. Not only is sin what you do or what you do not do, sin is why you do what you do, because the Bible says that everything that does not come of, does not come of faith is sin. So do you see that, that sin? It's not as easy as your behavior. Sin goes into the realm of the heart, because sin is a condition. And so, um, I don't even know why I, I started saying that, but, oh yes, the, the, the objective of, of temptation, it's not only to make you sin outwardly, but it's to lead you astray from God. The outward sins, friends, how do I say this without? Huh. Is killing a sin? Is it? Is killing a sin? Is lying a sin? I mean, we just went through the Ten Commandments, right? Is committing adultery a sin? Or is, is committing adultery sin? No? <laughs> yes. Good answer. Good answer, young man. What if I say no? And bear with me, okay? Killing, lying, cheating. These are sins. Plural. But sin, the, the, the primary condition... It's a much deeper condition. These things are symptoms of a much deeper disease. So, yes, lying, uh, committing adultery, uh, not being content with what you have, disarming your parents, these are all sins. But they are symptoms. You would still be a sinner. I mean, proof in point, most of us here haven't, I'd, I'd wager that 100% of us here haven't killed someone. Or perhaps committed adultery. Would you still be a sinner if you did not do these things? No, because it's our condition. And so temptation, friends, has this aspect. It has this, this, this strong, this strong uh, uh, strategy of leading you astray from God in a way where you rebel against him and you believe in yourself. You trust in yourself. Because the, Christian, the, Christian es the, the essence of Christianity, friends, is submission to God. Right? When you study, and I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but I find this really interesting. Um, when you, when you study and you analyze religion throughout history, there have always been two sides of religion. Right? Always. In whichever religion you go to, you either have right-hand right hand religions or left-hand side religions. All right? And so this goes all the way from Cain and Abel, and it comes down all the way to where we are today. And when you look at the right-hand religion, which is truly religion, God's religion, right? The religion, to, the worshiping the true God, you'll find a principle, which is the principle of submission. I submit to a higher power. He has control. He has, he knows what's best. Do you know what the, do you know what the, the concept or the, the, the foundation of the left-hand side religions are? You'll be surprised. Does anyone want to guess? Works, self, that's a good answer. Who said that? That's a good answer. The phone works from by myself. Rebellion. And here I'm talking about religions such as Satanism, all right, voodoo, these, animism. That's what I'm talking about. The, the foundation is moderation. In everything, moderation. It sounds weird. Moderation is a good thing, or we would believe so. 
But in this way of thinking, this line of thinking, moderation is a translation of, I am in charge. I decide what is moderation. Moderation in good and moderation in evil. Moderation in lust and moderation in modesty. Do you see? Moderation is me deciding what I want for my life. I will be moderate according to my own filter, my own definition of what moderation is. So I will do what is evil, but I also do what is good. That's the foundation of Satanism. It's moderation. And every temptation in the world has the basic uh, purpose of removing you from God and making you trust yourself. And then you do your own things, your own works, your own... You see? Moderation versus submission. I choose or God chooses. And so this is what uh, uh, Hezekiah is being tempted here. Do I look at the armies? Do I look at my resources? Do I look at or do I look to God? Verse 9, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 9, onward, says, Later, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says, On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Hezekiah says, The Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria. Verse 13, do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their, their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Apparently, Sennacherib here was the, he was the, the realist of the story. He was the realist. Note his arrogant tone. Who of the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me. How then can your God deliver you from my hands? In other words, the king of Assyria, he's saying here, history and appearances are not on your side. I have the greater army. I have numerical superiority. I have tactical and military superiority. I have greater resources. I have the prestige and the, co the confidence of previous success. His arrogance knows no bounds. Who is the God that can deliver you from my hands? Who do you think you are? Who do you think your God is? Friends, this is exactly how the devil attempts to deceive and pressure us. What can you do to change this situation? Who do you think you are? Look at the past. You've only failed. Martin Luther King, he said many times that we are frequently visit victims of something called paralysis of analysis. Which basically means that on the times when we, when we were, were faced with a big crisis, we become paralyzed by fear. And we don't know what to do. We don't know how to act. We're left paralyzed and remain absolutely helpless. Verse 17 here adds another detail to Sennacherib's psychological siege. It says that the king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him, just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Friends, have you ever received letters from the enemy? They come to us in many different ways. Family crisis, relationship traumas, Health complications, diseases, pandemics, quarantines, the horrible, the horrible prediction of an unfavorable diagnosis, unemployment, the loss of your current job, the loss of someone that's dear to you, children who have become a permanent source of un unrest, of worry, perhaps not enough resources to achieve a great dream, the loss of a, of a, of a great love, accusations and critiques that come from other people, injustice. All of these things are letters from the enemy. The possibilities for existential headaches are limitless. Have you received any of these letters in your life? We all receive them at one point or another. All of us do. And all of them with that small but perverse chorus, who is the God that can deliver you from my hand? Maybe you're carrying some of these today. Maybe right here, right now, 
behind your smile, you're carrying a letter from the enemy. And you don't know what to do. They're draining away your courage. They're draining away your joy, your resistance. That's what Hezekiah was dealing with here. And what's more, with Hezekiah, and in his case, he's not only dealing with his own problems, he's dealing with the burdens, the burden of, of hundreds of thousands of people in his city who are all on the brink of destruction. But friends, this is where we see the counterpoint of the story. Because Sennacherib, he, he committed two fatal mistakes. Two fatal mistakes. First of all, blinded by, by his pride, he and his, his generals did not have the slightest idea about the God of Judah and about his infinite resources. He had no idea who the God of Israel was. Secondly, they had destroyed the the impotent gods of the other nations. They had. But those were mere idols. Remember? There is no copy to God. There's only one God. Their previous victories were worthless now. And now Sennacherib was, against, was up against the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty. And now we realize that it was truly Hezekiah and not Sennacherib who was the realist of the story. It was Hezekiah who had the true overview of the situation. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than there is with him. This Assyrian Goliath was not aware that he was going up. He wasn't aware of who he was up against. He had no idea. This formidable enemy was nothing more than a paper giant. His pride, his claims didn't represent a threat to him who has in his hands all power. Observe Hezekiah's reaction here when he received the enemy's letter. uh, 2 Kings 19.14 Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Just like a small child when he's scared or frightened of something. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but when I was small and I was scared of lightning and thunder, I would go running to mommy and daddy's bed in the middle of the night. I see Hezekiah doing the same thing here. He's scared. He's terrified. This is a king. But inside, he's a child. Have you ever heard that that song, The Warrior is a Child? If you haven't, look it up on YouTube. The Warrior is a Child. You might be winning victories left and right. Everyone sees you with shining armor. But inside, the warrior is a child. And here we see that the king, he's a child. Because in his his innocence and in his, his, his helplessness, he takes these letters that he can't deal with. He runs to his daddy's house. And he lays them out before the Lord. 2 Kings 19, 15 and 16. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words that Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. Ellen White says that prayer is the solution to all our problems. Friends, the Lord invites us to spread before him the enemy's letters, to bring before him everything that bothers, that intimidates us. Look back to the past. Consider everything that God's interventions have done in your life. Await greater things. In his recognition of human fragility, God wants us to know that salvation comes only from him. He wants us to learn how to trust. Trust that he who is the Alpha and the Omega, he who is the pastor, the shepherd of the stars, who sustains and maintains the world in space, who became personally responsible for you and for me. He never forsakes us. Our pains become his pains. Our battles become his battles. We learn through Scripture that we are truly never alone. Friends, God Almighty maintains an inalterably binding code of honor with those who submit their lives to Him. And that is that those who trust in Him never cry alone. When you cry, dear friend, when you cry, God feels the salty taste of your tears upon His lips. Trust me. Trust me. The end here of this story, 
of Hezekiah's confrontation with Sennacherib is extraordinary, and it happens in just a few short verses. Because God is not a God of dilly-dallying. God isn't a God that, uh, you know, maybe uh, today's a good day. Uh, no. Our God is a God of action. Second Chronicles 32.20, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, they cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And now pay attention. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hands of all the others and took care of them on every side. One single angel wiped out an entire army. Who could have thought that that was an option? You know, this is the God of the Bible. The God who, you can't really, God is unpredictable. We sometimes want to put God in this tiny box and think that that is all that he is. Friends, our God is not a tame God. He's a ferocious God. He is not predictable. He is not controllable. You can't put him in your pocket. When the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, they had an army, the most powerful fighting force in the world behind them. They had mountain ranges on their sides and they had an ocean in front of them. Who could have thought that the ocean splitting in two was an option? Who could have ever expected that? Joshua was fighting his enemies. He needed more time. God stopped the sun. Who could have thought that that was an option? God is, this story is rigged in a way. <laughs> One single angel. I like to finish this message with a psalm. This psalm that I'm going to read for you, it's a short psalm, and it's called a battle psalm. A psalm of war. Right? And it might surprise you because this psalm contains verses that are, you know, they're, they're, they're very well known. They're cute verses. They're verses that you'll see, you know, isolated on a, you know, maybe on, a, on, a, on one of those uh, picture frames that you put in your house that you buy from Etsy, you know. God is good. God is, you know, for example, this is Psalm 46, all right? And basically it says here, you know, this is the, this is the chapter that says, um, come, behold the works of the Lord. That's a beautiful verse. You know, this is the verse, this is the chapter here that says, be still and know that I am God. That's a beautiful, that's, you know, it's, com it's comfy. Behold the works of God. No, come, be still. No, but I'm going to read this chapter for you. And the context of this chapter is this battle that we just read here in the Bible. Apply it to that. This is called a battle psalm, a psalm of, of war. And that's the psalm that says, come, be still and know that I am God. All right, this is that comfy, you know, cute, little Etsy image uh, uh, kind of psalm, okay? It's a battle psalm. It says this, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. I want you to imagine, as I read this, I want you in your, in, in your mind to imagine Jerusalem sieged by hundreds of thousands of men. I want you to see them receiving these letters and criers out on the, on the hillsides, all right? Jerusalem is a, is a city on a hill, so they're out there and they're, they're a little lower and they're crying out, God is ridiculous, he will not save you, Hezekiah is lying to you, you will be destroyed, look at what we did, we gouged out their eyes, we cut their hands, we dragged them back to our city with hooks in their noses, all right? That's a horrible, I want you to imagine all that and then this battle song. I think I turned the page. God is our refuge and our strength. A very present help in a time of trouble. And what trouble was that siege? Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. He's talking of Jerusalem. God shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Imagine dawn. That dawn, after the angel of the Lord came, all right, Israel is kind of tentatively coming out. They're, they're, they don't know what, 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 what happened yet. Okay, Imagine that moment where the angel comes, destroys the army, and Israel is starting to figure out what just happened. Okay, they're coming out, they're looking over the, well, where's all the noise? Where's the movement? What happened here? 
God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. They roared. Is another good word for this word here in Hebrew. They, the nations roared. They raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What are his works? He just destroyed hundreds of thousands of people. An enemy army. Those are his works here. It's not a cute little thing. All right? This is a vicious thing that just happened. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth, he makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns chariots in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our rest. What are the letters that the enemy has sent to your life? Present them to this God. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns chariots with fire. I will be exalted. Come behold the works of God. He can do the same works in your life. He's more than willing to present the letters of the enemy before this God. And God will surprise you with what he can do. He can pull any situation from anywhere. He can split a sea in two. He can stop the sun. He can certainly take care of you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we know that you are our shelter in a time of storm. And Father, we know that the world throughout this past year and a half has been through a terrible storm on many fronts. And Lord... Sometimes we do feel overwhelmed. We feel so overwhelmed sometimes. But Lord, when we look back at Scripture, we see that our worries, our doubts, our, these anxieties that we might have, Lord, they, they melt before you. When you utter your voice, the, the Bible just said here that the earth melts. You cut the bow in half. You break the spear and you burn the chariots with fire. Lord, it's, it's hard for us sometimes because we're so small and we're so tiny. And sometimes we think that we, we put you in this box, Lord, of what we think, what we expect of you. But Father, we please open our eyes daily. Like, like that servant that had to have his eyes opened and see the help being provided by God, the chariots of fire. Lord, we need that daily because it's so easy for us to lose sight of how big you are and how small we are and also how small our problems are. They're big to us because we're tiny. But before you, they melt away. Father, we, we lay our letters before you, admitting that we are weak, we're small, we're tiny, we're fallible. We're not as great and as good and as big as we think we are. But Lord, in that submission and in that admission, we cling to your promises that whoever cries with you never cries alone. That whoever is with you is never the minority, is never, is never outnumbered. So Father, we cling these promises. You know everyone here. You know everyone's battle, everyone's struggle. And I submit them in your hand. Father, I beg your spirit upon us. Please fill us. Because we admit we're not as full as the spirit as we wish we were, as we should be. So please fill us daily. And allow us to overflow so that we can give of you to those that are around us. Bless this church, Father. You know that they, they exercise, they exert a, an influence in this community. Allow that influence to grow. Not for their sake, for the church has no owners but for the sake and the glory of your name. And we already know the outcome, Lord. Your name shall be exalted. Allow us to participate in that. I thank you and I ask you these things in the authority, in the power, and in the name and love of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.
May God bless you.